Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. You know, if you're a regular viewer of my videos, you probably wonder why the why the heck I have to uh, always say the same thing at the beginning? Well, some people, you know, this might be the first video of mine that they've seen, so I guess I, you know, just do it. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, there's a chapter in Peter Wadhams' book. Peter Wadhams is my climate hero. His book, A Farewell to Ice, highly recommended. Tell your library to get a copy, read it, study it and uh, learn from it. So, I'm going to talk about his book, Chapter 9. Basically, Arctic Methane. A catastrophe in the making. Okay, that's what he, that's what Peter called the uh, chapter. Okay, so we've got permafrost, frozen ground on the land. This is the looking at the earth from the top. We've got the Arctic Ocean here. We've got the land all around here. We've got permafrost on the land, frozen ground as it's warming, as it's raining instead of snowing up in the Arctic. That permafrost is melting deeper and deeper. Water percolates down, takes heat. We've got the stuff thawing out. Okay, there's a lot of organic material that was laid down there um, that's, uh, you know, as old as the last ice age, comes from, um, and uh, basically this stuff is sawing out, okay? It's being attacked by bacteria. If it's near the surface, there's oxygen available. The bacteria breaks down that carbon, oxidizes it, produces CO2. If there's not oxygen, so if it's in a lake, <coughs> small lake or underneath the ground, the bacteria munch away in anaerobic decomposition this time. There's no oxygen, so it breaks it down, produces methane. Global warming potential of methane. Okay, 34 times that of CO2. This is over 100, 100 years. 86 times CO2 over 20 years and greater than 150 times in a few years. Okay, so molecule by molecule, CO2, which we, all, we, which we talk about a lot, is just can't cut it with methane. It's CO2 supercharged. Okay, so it's in this terrestrial permafrost, but there's very shallow... <coughs> Shallow, there's vast, shallow continental shelves underneath the ocean. Waters vary up to, you know, basically most of them in the range 50 to 100 meters. The largest of them is the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. 75% of this vast area, I think it's 2.1 million square kilometers or something, 75% of that 2.1 million square kilometers is 40 meters or less deep. Okay, so the water column is very shallow. If you get methane coming up from the seafloor, it just goes right through the water column up into the atmosphere for the most part. Okay, so let's look at what's happened. You're, you're probably familiar with the paper that Peter was involved in that was talking about a 50 gigaton burst of methane. This could be in one year and then modeled over a decade, or it could occur five gigatons a year. Five gigatons a year over a decade, so 50 gigatons in total. They looked at the economic cost. I think they came up with a number of something like 60 or 70 um, trillion. 
you know, compared that to the global economy sizes, and you're talking about huge um, costs, massive costs if this stuff comes up. You know, people, I always try to put the numbers in. I mean, it's human lives, it's effect on humanity, misery, all this stuff. But, you know, people always, the, the economy, the, 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 the peanut uh, counters want to, the accountants want to talk about the dollar figure. Okay, so there's loads of this methane in the continental shells. So what is different? You know, why, why is this such a concern? Well, let's talk about the water layers. Okay, so if this is a surface water, this is at zero meters. Okay, down to about 150 meters in the Arctic. We, we call it the polar surface water. I touched on this a bit in my last video. And the temperature of this, it's, a, it's near freezing. It's about zero, you know, it's close to freezing. Or minus 1.8 is the freezing point of, of seawater. Okay, but it's mostly fresh, so it's close to zero degrees. Okay, you get this layer of cold water. This is when there's ice on top. Okay, you have ice on top. Okay, the, the sea ice, so you have this uh, polar surface water, then you go down to about 900 meters, and then you go down to the bottom here of the sea. This is Atlantic water, okay? So this is warmer. Warm and salty. So warm and salty is heavier than colder, fresher. Okay, and then you have bottom water. And this is cold. Okay, so you basically have a warm, salty layer sandwiched between a very cold, salty layer and a fresh, cold layer. Okay, this is what happens. Now, the continental shelf is only, this is zero, the ice is on top, this is only, uh, say, 100 meters or so. So we only have the one type of water there. Okay, so this water, we have the one type of water, then we have the seafloor here. So the water temperature just above the sea level, floor is close to freezing. The sediments stay frozen. <coughs> okay, now what happened in 2005? At, from 2005 roughly onwards, we have lost the ice over the eastern Siberian Arctic shelf. We've lost the ice over the, in the Laptev Sea, over those continental shelves. We've now lost the ice. Okay, this is a new phenomenon. The ice has shrunk back so much that um, we don't have, we can take away that ice cover here. Okay, get rid of the ice cover. So what effects is that? Well, Peter has said that uh, in August 2014, the, uh, no, first of all, where was it? In the summer of 2011, a surface temperature of 7 degrees Celsius was detected <coughs> in the Chukchi Sea. Okay? 7 degrees Celsius was the sea surface temperature. Now, he himself was in the U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker Healy in August of 2014. And the sea surface temperature was 19 degrees Celsius. Or, sorry, 17 degrees Celsius. The air temperature was 19 degrees Celsius in this region. Okay? What happens is, when you lose the ice, as long as there's some ice there, 
even the smallest amount, the water, the temperature will be zero, and this, this temperature of this uh, plug of water between the surface and above the continental shelf will be close to zero. As soon as the ice is gone, temperature starts rising rapidly. <coughs> right? You have, a, you have a kilogram of ice, and you put so much energy to it, you end up with a kilogram of water. Then you put that energy to that kilogram of water, and the temperature goes from zero degrees to 80 degrees Celsius. So as long as you have ice there, the water around it is at zero. As long as the ice is gone, the temperature skyrocketed. <coughs> the ice is no longer, the Arctic's no longer the air conditioner. It no longer keeps things cool. So the sea surface temperature was 17 degrees Celsius. Now, also, I've talked about waves getting larger and larger because there's a long fetch, okay, long distance. The wind blows over, okay, the waves just build up over time. And uh, the waves, the big waves here, cause water to mix all the way down to the seafloor. So the seafloor temperature gets very hot and it starts really thawing out the permafrost on the seafloor. It perforates the layer. Okay, now let me tell you the problem with the models, okay, and the modelers. Okay, you say everything's hunky dory, we don't have to worry about a big plug of methane coming out. Okay, people used to say that the ice sheet on Antarctica, you know, this is bedrock, this is the ice. They said that this ice sheet would take thousands of years to melt. Okay, well, what happens is, it's not a very good, let me, let me draw a, okay, thousands of years, but the problem, this is this layer by layer, melting just by temperature, very simple and incorrect uh, model. What happens is you get these moulins forming, and they drill down through the ice, and then they bring water, and, which runs along the bedrock underneath, runs into the ocean. Okay, and these things, so it's like Swiss cheese after a while. Okay, well, this is the surface water, this is uh, 40 meters deep, say, this is the eastern Siberian Arctic shelf, you've got the frozen permafrost, you've got methane clathrate, okay, what happens is there was a layer here which was supposedly thought to trap the clathrate, this is melted, you have these talex, areas of unfrozen ground. They act as, as vents for the methane to come out <coughs> from the clathrate. So since 2005, instead of having zero degrees Celsius water, close to freezing, okay, zero, zero degrees Celsius water, close to freezing, okay, we now have 17 degree water, you know, huge high, really high numbers in this water column that are mixed, you know, so I think set plus seven at least around the bottom. It's melting through the sediment. We have these frozen talix, which the, these talix here of unfrozen ground within the frozen ground. There's no longer a layer here, a membrane stopping or a plug stopping the methane from coming up. And now we get methane coming up. Okay, so if we get enough weakening of this area, this is what Peter was modeling with the 50 gigaton burst. So this is new. Okay, this is, uh, so this is analogous, these talics are analogous to the moulins in the glaciers. Forget the model, we can't, you, a model is to try to explain reality. If the model doesn't explain reality, what's happening on the ground, throw out the model, go back to the drawing board, start a game. Instead of that, the IPCC says, oh, the model, you know, we'll take the models, this is what's going to happen, and this is what they publish in the report, goes to the policymakers, it's insane. Okay, it's really insane. Get real, people. <coughs> you know, it's, uh, anyway, read the book. Here it is again, Farewell to Ice. Thank you, my website's paulbeckwith.net.